good night, everyone. Um, well, you know, as introduced by Amy, my name is Rakesh. Um, I did my MSc thesis on niche separation of scorpions and lowland evergreen forests. Right. Um, so basically, um, the study sites were arena and bush bush forest reserve. Um, the whole idea about it is that scorpions, you see, you, you see, you, you see more, you see them all. Right. They basically all kind of basically uniform and physical makeup and life habits. Right. Um, but the question arises: How do multiple species of scorpions, right? How are they able to coexist within the same type of environment without all competing each other? Right, so the nature of my project was actually to go into these forests and understand how they partition the resources to enable our different species of scorpions to, to basically live in harmony with each other. Um, so I first like to play a video, um, which was part of a submission for um, re our research day. It, it highlights some aspects of the research project, um, as well as some general information on scorpions. After that, I'll just follow up with a few um, brief pointers on the project as well and more general information on the, um, the scorpions. So, you know, get going. Tropical forests are famous for their diversity of organisms, including arthropods. With an estimated 41,000 species of arthropods known to inhabit this oasis of life, the question remains, how exactly do these many organisms share resources? One group of arthropods in particular where resource partitioning has been the subject of question is scorpions. Scorpions represent an ancient group of terrestrial arthropods dating back to the Silurian period that existed over 440 million years ago. Despite a relatively high diversity with over 1500 species distributed worldwide, Scorpions are remarkably uniform in physical makeup and life habits. There are eight known species of scorpions inhabiting Trinidad, with six in Tobago. Tropical forests comprise of a myriad of wildlife and hold various niches that scorpions can occupy, such as leaf litter, shrubs, and various microhabitats on trees. Scorpions are nocturnal and difficult to locate and observe in situ due to their cryptic nature. However, with the discovery of the fluorescence of scorpions under ultraviolet light, it made finding these creatures much easier. Why and how does this happen? We know that scorpions possess a chemical called coumarin in the exoskeleton, and this fluoresces under UV light, but the exact ecological significance of this glowing is still a subject of debate. MSc student Rakesh Bukal is captivated by scorpions. In tropical forests, there exist several St. Patrick species of scorpions. How exactly they partition their resources to allow for coexistence is one of the perpetual mysteries in scorpion ecology. Differential use and selection of microhabitats is believed to be the underlying mechanism that allows for this resource partitioning. So you're probably asking yourself, why study scorpions? Well, two major reasons, the medical and ecological significance of scorpions. In Trinidad, a high proportion of the scorpions belong to the genus Buthidae, and species of this genus have been known to cause human fatalities worldwide. One particular species belonging to this genus is Titius trinitatus, which is endemic to Trinidad. It is the most venomous scorpion in the West Indies, and is the only scorpion known to cause human fatalities locally. How venomous are scorpions? Well, <clears throat> scorpions are... Uh... The, 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 the lethality of their venom does vary from species to species. Mm -hmm. The two that are of major concern to us in terms of the toxicity of the venom would be the Titius trinitatis mm -hmm. and the Centuroides. There are some lasting effects even after someone has been stung by Titius. Yes. Yes. Um, the, the, the venom attacks the pancreas okay. and we get uh, late onset diabetes mm -hmm. in those patients okay, okay. and the onset of the diabetes can be as much as 18 months to 3 years post, after post yes. 
So, so you would say definitely the Tetias trinitatis is, is a species of significant medical importance. It is. So, Dr. Simmons, as if someone gets bitten with a scorpion, right? Um, what would you advise that their first course of action would be? Well, the first course of action should be to keep the patient calm, mm -hmm. as calm as possible. Um, we recommend that the bite site be kept um, higher than the heart, mm -hmm. if it is at all possible. Um, the reason for this is that you're trying to minimize the rate at which the venom gets to the heart and then will be pumped mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, out um, through all parts of the body. Um, but the underlying theme is to get the person as quickly as possible mm -hmm. to um, a hospital. For this study, we surveyed two lowland evergreen forests in Trinidad, the arena forest and bush bush forest, to determine niche separation of scorpions in these two areas. Arena forest is located in North Trinidad and bush bush in East Trinidad. Surveys were conducted between the hours of 8 to 12 over a four month period from December 2015 to March 2016. Ultraviolet flashlights of wavelengths 395 nanometers were used to locate scorpions since they fluoresce when illuminated with this light. Set trails were walked at each sample location and microhabitats from the ground to the subcanopy level were surveyed. Multiple surveyors used UV flashlights to survey various microhabitats. Specimens were collected with large forceps by gently clasping their telson and identified in the field. Only difficult to identify species were removed from microscopic analysis. The microhabitat of each scorpion collected was identified over a total of six sample events per site. A knowledge, attitudes and practices survey was conducted in areas of North and South Trinidad. Niche partitioning is the mechanism that allows different species to coexist in the same habitat with limited resources by allowing differential use of these resources. Scorpions occupy various microhabitats within these forest types. In this study, we surveyed microhabitats ranging from the ground level to the subcanopy level. These microhabitats include bare soil, leaf litter, on and below debris, on shrubs, on loose bucket trees, and on exposed branches. 116 persons were interviewed for the KP survey. We found 43% of persons interviewed thought scorpions were insects and not arachnids. 37% had encounters with scorpions, and 48% of these individuals felt they should kill a scorpion when encountered, whereas 28% felt like they should do nothing at all. 100% of all persons interviewed felt that all scorpions were venomous. 48% of all interviewees knew someone that had been stung, with 31% of these victims becoming ill, 11% had no reaction, and 3% died. A number of different home remedies were listed as treatments for scorpion stings, such as drinking sugar water, roasting and eating the scorpion, cutting the sting site and squeezing venom out, drinking milk, tying the sting site, snake bottle, drinking mud water, spitting on the sting site, eating charcoal, and eating herbs. These, however, cannot be validated as effective treatments since different scorpions have different venom potencies and scorpions have been known to give dry stinks. How many times were you stung? I was stung twice from the same scorpion. When I got stung, I felt a sharp pain travel up my left arm because I got stung on my left index finger. Uh, it traveled up straight up to my shoulder. The medical people in the hospital treated me as a priority case and took me directly into a treatment room. If it's a serious sting or it appears to be having um, symptoms, shortness of breath, etc., then you want to get medical attention right away. But as a general rule, a good, um, a good um, remedy, a good immediate home remedy for just about any sting, whether it's a scorpion, a spider, an ant, or a bee, is to put something hydro hygroscopic on it. Uh, many people figure uh, put honey on it. Salt will do as well. Uh, salt or sugar, anything that draws up water, and that will draw it out. Like killing the scorpion, cutting off its sting and stuff. Any of those is probably valuable because it makes you feel like you're doing something. 
You know, it's it's very it's very demoralizing. You have an accident, something goes wrong. And, you know, it's very demoralizing to say, oh, I can't do anything about it. So, um, you know, if, um, uh, if, if you're doing something about it, you feel better and, and it there are many misconceptions about scorpions regarding the number of species and venom potency of each. We know that scorpions can coexist in different microhabitats. Not all scorpions are venomous, and there are eight species found in Trinidad. Despite the public conception about home remedies, the best approach is always to seek medical attention if stung. So, what does all of this mean? Are scorpions really stalkers of the night, or just misunderstood creatures? In reality, they are both. We have approximately over 2,000 species around the world, um, but the, the highlight of it all is that we have 10 species here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, eight in Trinidad as opposed to six in Tobago. If you look here to, to the right, you will notice um, a scorpion kind of embedded in sand. Right? This is actually a prehistoric fossil real scorpion that dated back however long ago. And if you, if you notice, um, the, the body plan is, is almost basically the same as, the, as our present day scorpion as well. So that's kind of indication of how successful these organisms are as an organism. Right? So, we could go through. Um, so, as I said before, we have 10 species of scorpions. Eight, eight, eight species belong to, to Trinidad. Um, so, this is one particular species. Um, what I did as well um, while doing um, my project, I compiled all the information about distribution of all the scorpions throughout Trinidad and Tobago and I came up with updated maps and updated distributions as well. So on the left would be a picture of the scorpion at the in, in the field and on the right would be the distribution of where they're currently found or the known localities throughout the country. On top is just a little bio about the species as well. Right? So here we have a Tetias platrotus, it's one of our smaller species. Right? Um, as you can see, kind of densely pegmented. Um, we have other things that have um, occurred throughout the island, so they're kind of basically all over the place. Um, and I think about the venom, if they have toxic venom, but because they produce such small quantities, it's not really known to be um, harmful to vertebrates. Right? Here now we have a Titia stenicorda, right, which is endemic, but um, there's also reports of it being found in Venezuela as well, so that's a little bit um, on a little scrutiny as to if it's really endemic to us. Before the species was previously called Titias discrepance, right? Um, but based on genetic work and stuff, they really found that it was a separate species. Um, so this, this is one of the larger species, um, but both sexes are a dark brownish red color. Um, but uh, a note about this particular species is the, is the length of the talson, or the tail. Um, it's particularly thin and long, right? Hence the name tenucoda, which means um, like long tail, right? Um, the toxicity of this particular species is unknown, so we don't really know the effects if, if, if anyone has come from it. You know, a lot of times I hear people get sent from scorpions and they say, well, all right, well, we get medical attention and we're fine. Um, and then again, some, someone gets sent from scorpions and we get adverse, adverse reactions. You think about it, it's just like a bore constrictor and a massive Right? They get sent from a, a, a bore constrictor. It can't say snakes not venomous. Right? It's the same thing with scorpions. So, you know, while a lot of emphasis is not being placed on, on um, developing antivenoms and stuff for scorpions, um, a point to note is that most nobody in hospitals can identify what species even some people to begin with. Right? And I think work like this mapping distributions are kind of characterizing the venom and stuff is, is where scorpion work should be heading towards. Good, very good. This is a Proteochactus nitidus. Um, it's endemic to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it's one of our chapters. So we have two, two types of scorpions, chapters and bootings, right? Our chapter species are non-venomous. They, they kind of secrete more enzymes than, 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 than toxic venom um, to subdue the prey. 
Um, these are mostly found in forest type environments, so you notice they kind of glossy color, so you kind of find them in more dark areas like in arena and bush bush and stuff like that. And we have the distribution of them here as well. Alright, so this is a Hananthera squissini. Right, again, it's one of our smaller species, it's kind of red. Um, one thing to note about this species, um, while conducting my project, um, I came across an unusual, I mean, we were talking about behaviors and stuff before. Um, I came across an unusual behavior with this particular species um, that had me thinking in the field. While collecting the specimen, um, first of all, I noticed the, the, the tip of the stinger for the talson was missing in one of the specimens. But they were, they were running around like, like nothing had happened, um, which is kind of unusual for scorpions that, that seem to have a damaged limb. Um, upon trying to collect the specimen, it shed one of its, um, one of its segments in its tail. The segment fell to the floor and breathed consistently for a couple of seconds while the scorpion made an escape. So it had me thinking, hmm, lizards do this as well. But you wouldn't really expect a scorpion or a arachne to be, you know, to, you know, to, to, to autonomize a, a, a limb, right? Further along that same night, I saw another scorpion of the this, of this same species, but the tells are also missing and running around scurriedly. So, when back home that night, I pulled up Google and researched auto autonomy in scorpions and found that the genus Ananteris is the only species around the world that can autonomize its, its, its appendage or its talson. And there was never a report um, for Ananteris to see doing that before. Right? So, we can switch in the next slide. Right? So, in the upcoming level world, you know, like with my whole nature, know that I did um, on autonomy in, in the entire species, and that's the specimen I got from, from the bush bush forest. Well. So, that's just something to look forward to in the next um, level world. So, these are the Trinitatis, um, which was also thought to be endemic to Trinidad, um, but now we have reports of it also being in Venezuela as well. Um, now, this is a species of significant medical importance. Um, it's probably the only species that's known to cause human fatalities in Trinidad, and it's by far the most venomous species in all of the West Indies. Right? Um, locally, we have no available antivenoms for Fetitius trinitatus, so that is something of a little concern because, I mean, they, 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 they are capable of causing human fatalities, and as you can see, the most venomous, one of the largest species, no antivenoms, and it's one of the most widely distributed species around the country. Right? Um, now that specimen was taken in, in Tobago. <coughs> um, it's a crab, a female, if you notice from the size of it. Does it call it Lactin? Yeah. So people have different names for it as well. So here we have a Microtitius rakai, which is also an adult to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it's one of the smallest species in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and in the genus, we also have a different species of Microtitius, and it's the smallest scorpion in the world. They like they literally are what, what, what the name implies, micro. Um, after the presentation, I'll share with you. I'll have some nice specimens there of Microtitius as well, and Antitius trinitatus. So you can see the size comparison and the differences among species. <coughs> Something particular to note about the Microtitius, um, the my Microtitius genus, is that apart from Microtitius rakai, we also have a Microtitius stari. That's endemic to Tobago, only found in Little Tobago, and actually was named after Professor Stan. Yeah. 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 Right? Um, I mean, no need to put a picture um, star right there because they're almost exactly identical. No, they're almost exactly identical to each other um, in, in appearance. There's just some minor um, differences when you look at them under the microscope with, with respect to the, um, the, the plates and the sum. So here we have a Titius Melanocyctus. This picture was taken at UE. Um, so UE does have a thriving population of Melanocyctus running around campus all by tennis court and things. Um, if you notice on this back, there's two little brown little things. Right? Um, that's babies. Right? So when scorpions give birth, um, the, the juveniles, the scorpions, as they call it, um, climbs onto their, mo their mother's back. Yeah, right. climbs onto their mother's back until the first insta or their first molt, right? When it sheds, um, oh, oh, yeah, when, when it molts for the first time, then they start to go out and feed on their own. Other than that, the mother is there taking, you know, um, parental care, <laughs> right? Um, so, yeah, so, you know, all scorpions or that's one of the species? No, all scorpions, scorpions, yeah, all scorpions. <coughs> yeah, all scorpions. So, I mean, apart from the scorpions, they're taking this so, you know, uh, like everything else, they, they do have a, a kind of strong parental care, especially with the mothers at, at, at this stage in the life cycle. 
Alright, um, here we have a Chactus ribbon hunter, which is also one of our Chactus species. Um, it's quote unquote non venomous. It's one of the largest, it is the largest species we have in Trinidad. Um, but as you can notice from the distribution map, it's only found in locality at the northern range. Probably Mount El Tucucha around those areas. Um, yeah, so. Are you going to tell us why that's really named? Yeah, it was named after. Raymond. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Raymond Mendez and myself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, my genius Ricky I is named after the son of Eric Waring. Who wrote this major uh, paper on the civil rights movement? Okay. And the PRU celebrated by the Prince of Rock. What's that? See, the name is wrong. I that wrong voice. Right, so why is this scorpions? Medical importance. Right, treatment of diseases. Scorpion venom is used to treat cancers. Um, it even has application for heart surgery to remove unwanted tissue around scarring and stuff when, when they actually perform surgery and stuff. So there are whole uh, Alzheimer's diseases as well. So there, there's, there's a lot of applications um, for the venom. Right? Um, so then anti venom production as well. Right? Like for the TS training tactics, as I mentioned before, which is quite deadly. So, as you can see, no anti venom for scorpion stings. Alright? So, as you can see from here, right? So, I mean, while we, we might, for, for those who, who might be familiar with you know, what takes place in the papers and stuff, what goes on mostly around the country, scorpions do cause fatalities, um, especially so to younger children and older persons as well. Um, because they are more susceptible, the old, the kind of mid mid-range healthy people can kind of fight it off, they're independent. But um, they do cause fatalities and it's something of, 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 of serious concern as well. Right, so scorpionism in Trinidad. Right, so for those who may not know, these are like an information as well. Right? Human casualty due to scorpion evaluation first noticed in the 1920s. According to reports from 2003 to 2004, scorpion and venomation is the leading venomous animal injury in southern Germany. Right? Between 1946 and 1950, there were 75 deaths from attacks by venomous animals. The majority of deaths were believed to be caused by scorpion stings. Right? And we are career blocking. But there are approximately 175 stings and 8 human deaths annually in Trinidad attributed to the of Trinidad that we might not know about. Um, by those information were taken from medical journals and stuff, so they were properly referenced. Um, probably not referenced yet, I um, Effects of envenomation by Tetia Trinitatis. These are some of the effects, right, that a lot of people suffer, right, after they, they, they are stung by this particular species, right? Cardiorespiratory complications, nausea, profuse salivation, salivation, intractable vomiting. That means they're consistently vomiting all the time. Right, the difficulty with respiration. The thing about um, scorpion venom is that it's, it's, a, it's a cocktail of neurotoxins. So you can literally shut down your nervous system, rise in temperature, uh, take a advice, and myocarditis, right? So that's like things to do with your heart and stuff like that. So these are some of the effects that people suffer from actually being stung by this particular species, right? In by the way, all the petias, everything is, 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 is are our species that I took in the field as well. So this was taken from one of the forests and this was able to be. Right, treatment of envenomation. Um, for most people who might know, treatment with potent specific antivenom is the best solution for scorpion stings. And our problem is work in our, in our species, especially the amount of endemic species we have is negligible. So we have no specific antivenom for our scorpion stings. Right? Um, they tried way back then, um, so like you can see, they only reported document, well, report documenting the use of scorpion antivirus in Trinidad was that of um, Kool King dating back in the 1960s. 
So they try to use a, um, a relative of the tree, that is an antivalent that was developed for it back in Venezuela. It did have some, um, well, it did work partially, but it didn't work as good as it needed to work because it wasn't specific to the scorpion venom. Right? So you know, these are next area of concern and, you know, in, in the developing proper antivalent <coughs> for our species. Um, why say scorpions? The other reason is because scorpions have a significant ecological importance as opposed to medical importance. They are general as predators, they feed in a wide array of food items, arthropods, just about anything they can um, they can subdue. Right? Um, they also control insect pest populations and they affect community energetics as well because they feed on so much arthropods, um, they can actually affect the biomass and the dynamics within the tropical forests. Right, so these various scorpions that I found while doing my surveys um, out, out in the boat arena and, um, and bush bush, as you can see, prey ranges from um, things like cockroaches to spiders to more cockroaches to more cockroaches. Um, this green scorpion here is a Brotiochactus nitidus, right? Um, that's hidden in a smaller um, conspecific, another Brotiochactus as well. Right? And here we have a Tetia trinitatis feeding on a smaller Tetia trinitatis. So basically, scorpions forage just about anything as I say that they can subdue, so that makes them really important in, in these cyclic environments when it comes to cycling of energies and stuff like that. Right? So you could go along. Right? So for my project, um, all the multiple species of scorpions, despite being you know, similar in habit, um, physical makeup and life habits, able to partition the resources. So I ruled out trophic partitioning. Basically, I ruled out that they would separate, um, they would be able to coexist by feeding on different things because as you can see from this slide before, they all basically feed on just about anything, right? So my hypothesis for this, after ruling out trophic partitioning, was that multiple species of scorpions would coexist by partitioning their other, well, the other type of resources, which is the microhabitats, right? Basically, foraging location. If I feed in a different location that you can't access or you not get, that means we kind of out of competition so that we can basically survive. So that was my working hypothesis for the, um, for the process. Right, um, so we come back to the separation. What is where and why are they there? Um, back again, so like just, just, just about any other organism, so all these are specialists and generalists, right? Species that specific to a particular area, specific to a particular diet. And then there are others that could basically eat most anything, <coughs> live mostly anywhere, right? So that was basically the concept about need separation, right? So you can, uh, all right, so this is a shelly side sites, all right? Um, again, arena forest, bush bush forest, who have, who haven't been here. Um, both the both both arena and bush bush were, were, were selected together because they were put to serve as replicates for each other. Um, not really to do a comparison among sites, but just have a replicate site that I could work with as well because they're quite similar in, um, in, in, the, in the forest structure. Right, so the best methodology, I mean, you saw some from the video who, who were there for BioBlitz from the previous years, um, those are better body methodologies as well. Um, all habitats were surveyed at night, probably between 7 or 8 till about um, 12 p.m. with the use of ultraviolet light. So, um, on that white light, scorpions are very hard to find and very cryptic in nature. Um, so it's it kind of real difficult to see out in the night. So with the ultraviolet light, you can see the difference with the same scorpion. Um, I'll demonstrate that after because I brought an ultraviolet light as well and some live scorpions. So you can see it in, in reality. And um, basically, they were, they were just collected with the, with the telson by, by a foster. Right? Um, right, so there's awesome. Right, so um, so I just briefly go into the, the results section. Um, each site had it six trips, right? Um, so for arena, I collected a total of 325 specimens, right? Um, belonging to five species. Um, can I take a picture? <coughs> right. Um, so if you notice here now, on top here we have the microhabitats that I surveyed, they are soil leaf litter and they bring on top of the river. And then we had the different species that were found within the, um, with, 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 within the survey site. Um, basically, those two areas highlighted because it shows the two microhabitats that the majority of species predominated in. Right? I will I explain the significance of that later on. I think. Okay, okay. Right? Now, if you notice, the last thing that was circled was um, on, the, on the back. Right? Um, and then if you follow back this line, you can see Microtetias rakai. 
right? As this species um, almost predominated in just one particular microhabitat. That, that gave my initial indication of how specialized it was for, 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 for that type of environment. So we could go along. Right? Um, same thing with the Dias Catritus, um, which was from, from primarily on shrubs. And if you go back to, um, you to go back to, but if you don't remember from the little bio I gave on the species before, you'll notice that the Titius clatritus was one of the smaller species and the uh, micro Titius was the, the smallest species. So you realize those two species kind of try to stay clear the bigger species, right? Um, so it kind of gave an indication of how, the, you know, they started to partition the, 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 the niches. Right. Um, this was for Bush Bush, 288 specimens were collected here. Almost the same type of um, the almost the same type of trend we found um, between both sites. Right? So that kind of you know, clarified that they kind of replicate and good to replicate with each other. So this was a combination now of all the scorpions and all the microhabitats on the both sites to give you a holistic picture now of what actually happened with scorpions on our world. And it's almost the exact same trend we found here as well. Right? So this table, basically, after rigorous calculations, <laughs> we came up with niche breadth and pairwise niche overlap, and overlap within guild, right? So I just give you a basic rundown. Um, pairwise niche overlap runs from zero to one, right? Um, with zero being almost no overlap, closer to one meaning there's significant overlap. And if you look at it, just clatritus, they come along, we can um, skip, right? So if you notice, right, Microtetius rekai, you see, you get values are almost zero, right, for, for that species. So that means it didn't overlap in niches with almost no other species. So Microtetius rekai could, 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 could inevitably be said to be a highly specialized species only being found in that particular microhabitat. So you could probably go there at any one point in time on that backy trees, loose backy trees, and not find anything else but a Microtetius rekai. Right, um, could go again. <coughs> right, um, Protea chapters netted us kind of close at the one, right? So if you come Protea chapters and you go up with a, a, an Anteras cusini, right? So those, um, both of those species kind of inhabited the same area. So that is significance of that value of being 0 0.67. And they kind of expect it because if you go back again to the bio um, that I did on the scorpions before, you're going to realize they're kind of around the same size as well, right? So they kind of could, you know, deal with each other. Um, so if you go again, Titius clatritus and Titius trinitatus. Not so much so the same in sizes, but um, they, they were found to, to kind of occupy the same habitat as well. Right, so you could go along. Niche breadth of scorpions. Um, basically, the smaller the niche breadth, the more specialized. Um, the larger the niche breadth, meaning they're able to occupy more areas and more microhabitats for foraging. So, Melanocytus kind of found almost everywhere. Um, then you put down the less and you come down with the market to just work out and perform in really just one half. Uh, right, so in our inner forest, we found that all five cells of the species of scorpions were able to coexist by using different microhabitats. We found the same thing in bush bush, right? Um, and we found that they were generalist species and specialist species as well within the forest microhabitats. Um, so we just have some limitations, limited visibility with dense canopy. I mean, I would like to go like 40, 50 feet up in the air to see, you know, what's going on up there. But, and also that, ha that microhabitat, I had to eliminate from this study. Um, limited range of UV flashlight, I could only see so far as well. Um, and I would like to do a longer survey period, um, both dry and wet season, so I could get a comparison to see if we have any climatic factors affecting the distribution of species at any one point in time, especially or temporarily. Um, yeah, so the conclusion about the whole thing is, Multiple species of scorpions will coexist in a geographic location by partitioning their microhabitats to reduce interspecific competition. And that's my acknowledgement for the project. So uh, that's basically um, in a nutshell kind of thing. But these are just some little things to the end, um, like the most deadliest scorpion in the world, which is the Indian red scorpion. Um, that's found in India, Pakistan, those areas and things. That's like extremely highly venomous. Right, this is a Microtetia species, it's the world's smaller scorpion. That's our adult female. Right? Um, our species is not much bigger than that by the way. Um, so we could go along. And these are Emperata, um, Emperor Scorpion. These kind of um, real popular in the factory. Um, they're not venomous, obviously. 
um, and they're, they're quite big. Um, they're not venomous. Huh? They're not venomous. Well, not toxic. <laughs> um, as I said before, most of them have like enzymatic um, suffers, but nothing, nothing important to, to cause any kind of um, so, yeah, so that's basically it.